My name is Dr. Kevin Pekka. I want to make a podcast that exposes people to the true miracles of life and health. All the guests on this show have been specially picked because they bring something positive to the world. They have some of the most amazing and inspiring life stories. These people have a passion for living, healing, and leaving the world better than they found it. There is something inside these people that made them keep fighting through all the tough times, even when people told them it was not possible. They carried on and made their lives beautiful again. And now they are sharing their experiences with the world. This is the Expect Miracles podcast. Enjoy the show. Today's episode is all about asking yourself, what are you capable of in this life? We each have a lot more in us than we know. Today on the Expect Miracles podcast, we have Evan Hines. Evan is an extremely talented musician out of New York City. He just finished a tour with his band and realized he needed to make a big life change. About six months ago, the longest distance Evan ever ran was about three miles straight. After deciding he wanted to improve his life, his health, his relationships, and his music career, he decided that he was going to jump in 100% and run an ultra marathon. That is an extremely bold statement coming from someone whose personal record was three miles, but that's how Evan operates. He cannot do anything halfway. It's go big or go home. And a couple months ago, with five months of training, Evan ran an ultra marathon 50 miles straight without stopping in around 15 hours. To me, this is a beyond impressive athletic feat Evan accomplished. I used to commute 55 miles to work in the morning, and the thought of running that straight through seems unfathomable. Today, I wanted to pick Evan's brain about his mindset, mental toughness, what it is the body's actual capable of, and how running 50 miles can permeate through your entire life and make every aspect of it better. The main thing I took away from this episode is that we are all capable of doing amazing things. We just need to start somewhere, keep going, stay focused, stay driven, and our goals are ours for the taking. Please welcome Evan Hines. Today on the Expect Miracles podcast, we have a very special guest, Evan Hines. Evan just had a very, very impressive athletic adventure. He ran 50 miles in one shot from somebody that didn't think they could probably run five a year ago. I mean, I don't know many people that could do that. That's one of the most impressive things I've ever heard. 50 miles in one shot. I think you'd be surprised what people are capable of. The body is more capable than we know. Would you say that's right? Definitely true, man. Absolutely. So Evan, before we jump into everything you're doing now, just give us a little background on yourself, where you're from, and uh, what you're into growing up. I'm from Garden City on Long Island, New York, and uh, grew up real into sports. I was a big baseball player. And uh, that was my life till I hit about 13 and discovered guitar, weed, and girls, the sex, drugs, rock and roll package. Yes. It's a real thing. So was that the first time you picked up a guitar? I was about 10, and my dad, I think, always wanted to play the guitar. I always had one hanging around the house. Yeah. He'd teach me, like, smoke on the water. That's like everybody's first yeah. little riff. Oh, yeah. A couple Zeppelin tunes here and there, and then... I think I took three lessons and surpassed him and then never looked back. <laughs> wow. So you just took to it right away. You're like, this is awesome. Yeah. I'm good at this. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, guitar and, and like baseball from when I was a little kid, I golfed a lot too. Like, like sports was a big part of my life until like kind of high school. How did you not get roped into lacrosse out there? I did. I played it for two years and, uh, you know, it was very promising. Yeah. But out. I mean, that's the cream of the crop at Long Island. Everybody's playing out yeah. there. Oh, yeah. I, I think I was too cool. You know, <laughs> I like the strategy of baseball. There you go. What'd you play in baseball? I was a pitcher. Not do you. Yeah. You look like a pitcher. <laughs> you know, the, I could have done this running back then. It might have helped my baseball career a little yeah. bit more. But yeah, I, uh, I played until I was about 13 and then I had a, a torn labrum, my right shoulder actually. Because I, I, I threw like very hard and it was kind of like natural talent. It was before everyone started like lifting weights and that's kind of right when I started fading out. Were you throwing any curves? No curves, just, just hard, just heat. Yeah, man. Wow. Sweet chin music. Smoking it by people? Wow. Amazing. And then, yeah, kind of high school hit and music became, I was, music was always a passion of mine. My, uh, so to take it far back, my middle name is George. And both of my grandfathers are George, and both of them are the only real like musicians I know in the family, other than wow. me and my brother. And uh, what did they play? 
my father's father George was a violinist, just amateur would play at home and and my mother's father sang doo wop like in no the way yeah. I love doo wop yeah oh yeah so uh people just got together back then and just started humming yeah they go on the subways he used to tell me that like they would have a deal with this one cop back in ozone park like they just like let him sing till like 5 p.m and then the cop would watch him a little bit and then he'd be like all right you guys gotta get the hell out of here no way so yeah so my mother's father george he would always sing and dance with me when i was a little kid and my siblings and cousins and stuff and just was like always in there music was always so present in my life and then when i was like 10 and i was like into led zeppelin and shit like that and it just everything clicked. I was like, this is what I'm all about forever. And then basically from like 13, you know, I went to music school in Los Angeles, Los Angeles College of Music in Pasadena. Shout out. How did you like that? Um, incredible experience. I did not know you went to uh, school out in California. I think that's probably why we met. Actually, I was out there working on tour and yeah cause you were you were cousin. touring around and you stopped at our place in huntington beach for a couple of days and then but but about six months before that maybe a year before that i was still in school out there so my touring opportunities kind of crossed over with some connections from school and so right out of high school did you just start touring with the band no i went to college and okay. then I started playing gigs in la and oh so because i met you out there a couple of years ago yeah i would say probably 2015 or 2016 so what were you doing before the music school out there another music school no, at all. I'm confused. So, like, I met you, what, when you were 25? No, we probably met... 24? 23, I think. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what did you do after ago. high school from 18 to, like, 22? I went to Los Angeles College of Music. So, you were graduated for a couple of years after. Okay. Yeah, my school was just a year and a half. It was real quick. And then, about 20 years old, I started... I came back to New York, started playing gigs, started touring around, playing as many bands as I possibly could. Did it feel right back then like you might have something and Yeah, I just always like knew that like I wanted to, to make a career like out of like something you love. That's what everyone tells you that like the dream is and like I happened to find something that I knew like way I didn't want to go to college when I was a kid cuz I knew it wasn't going to help me get to where I really wanted to go. Although I was a bit wrong cuz college did help me a lot. Damn. That's uh that's a powerful thing to know when you're that young. Yeah. Yeah, it was weird cuz nobody really believed me either. It's like a hard thing to like accept when your parents work hard and then you want you to go to college, there's all this pressure, but I just wanted to play my guitar. <laughs> Absolutely. Did uh was your brother the same way? Was he he was a musician you said as well? Uh yeah, he came into it probably even before I did. He's two years younger. I feel like he got a bass or something before I had anything. And uh, both of us was music and sports kind of always. He's a crazy tennis player. I think he was on the varsity team in like middle school. Like, and he, he's a drummer and like programs beats and stuff. Did mad, you guys ever like scientist. collaborate when you were? We have some. I have some projects in the works right now that have some brotherly collabs, some other brotherly collabs with some friends who I consider brothers as well. Unreal. So Ev, yeah. how was your health at this point? Were you into working out? The road life can be tough to stay healthy. You're always eating out and everything like that. So were you always into health and running or when did that start and what was it like being on tour with? Yeah. So basically like high school through college, I really didn't care about health. I didn't think about it twice. In college, I think I started running on a treadmill half a mile here and there, started lifting weights being like, oh, I think I probably should stop eating so much <laughs> and uh, not doing any physical exercise. And then I'd say about like 22, I really got turned on at like a physical regimen and like really taking care of myself, eating better. Like it's really just a self-love thing that tied it all together. Because before then I was kind of just young, immature, searching around like, like what is this life like all about? Like why is everything going on? You know, like, and then you hit a point where you're like, you can kind of get a bit more comfortable with yourself and you realize that it's, you know, it is worth it to eat healthy. It is worth it to take care of yourself, you know, tell yourself, I love you. You're a good person. Absolutely. <laughs> Put those veggies in there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just the same thing in my book. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And then, so what was life like on the road? On the road is just hard to get a sleep schedule going. It's hard to eat consistently. Although I was in this band, the Shacks, shout out to Max Schrager, always was on the Yelp and would basically find any like good coffee shop in any town yes. in every state we were in, in, a, in which is almost like 50 probably like 46 states but other than like breakfast like venues in america don't just i don't know some lower tier venues i would say like yeah. you know like 
once you get up to theaters and stuff like that, they take care of their artists. But, you know, if you're like a struggling band, up and coming band, like they usually give you some like beer tickets, maybe a 12 pack, you know, but you're on your own for food. And uh, a lot of times it's just like you're tired and you just want something that's going to fill you up and make you feel good. So you eat, you know, you eat whatever you see that's terrible for you. <laughs> and it's a vicious cycle. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much, man. So I guess you weren't feeling all that bad. I mean, because you were loving what you did and you were playing music every night and you just weren't eating healthy. How were you feeling at that point? I was lying to myself. I was telling myself I was feeling like probably an eight or nine out of 10. And I was really feeling like a five out of 10 telling myself that it was okay. So uh, I did mean like I kind of was a slow climb from like 18 to like I'm 26 now. Like I've started about 18 kind of like running a little bit push-ups here and there, going to the gym, figuring out how to build muscle. And then it wasn't until like 22 when I was like, okay, now I need to do something, which is when most of the tour, like heavy touring I did happen. So I was always trying to like get squats in at the gas station, you know, <laughs> yes. push-ups in the hotel room. Like I had like a circuit of like, you know, um, burpees, push-ups, squats, yeah. lunges, anything you could do, planks, wow. just anything in a hotel room. But even still, it su- it's just so hard to stay consistent in that lifestyle. So then finally got off of the road and that's been a year and a half now and back in february which leads to the running back in february i saw a podcast for the guy called david goggins who is just a beast everyone should just go check him out because he's inspiring and it applies to anybody's life any aspect in life i don't care what you're doing you could definitely take something from anything that guy says because he is truly just an absolute beast yeah he just tells his story as he sees it his audio book he's reading it with another person and it, like it's no bs like it's if you listen to his story and then look at yourself in the mirror and tell talk to yourself about your life you can't i mean you can continue to lie to yourself but that's just going to lead you nowhere and it'll lead you down and uh we're all about getting up over here you absolutely know, getting better so Ev, how do you come down to the conclusion one day i'm going to run 50 miles because yeah you could you could have just ran two or three and you know probably stayed pretty healthy what was it that you were like i'm putting all the cards on the table and just absolutely going for this so i'm a pretty extreme person i like to like dive into sh- to stuff when I, when I get into it and my friend andrew lacoche who i work with make a lot of music got some projects up and coming nothing we can name yet <laughs> but uh he saw the podcast as well and this guy david goggins i think he ended up running 200 miles in one shot Holds holds a world record for most pull ups consecutively, which is like four thousand plus, I think. And he's the example of what human beings are capable of doing. Not everyone's going to do that. I don't need to run two hundred miles. Maybe one day I will. Who, who the hell knows? But yeah, the, we, this guy just like proved that I was lying to myself about so many things. And I went from running like one mile to three miles. And by the time and like each week I was going up five, eight. By the time I hit about eight miles, and we were into this podcast and talking about it, we were like, we should do an ultra. And like I and he was like, what? My friend Andrew was like, why don't we do like a marathon? I was like, no way! Like, let's just go. Let's, <laughs> let's just go for it. Yeah, it just turned me on so much to like the idea of going from never running before April that like six months ago, I never ran more than three miles in, to, to, in my whole life, and then in August doing fifty miles in fourteen hours. Just the idea of that alone, I was like, that's ridiculous. And then the closer I got, the more I was like, all right, my training's going well. Like, you know, I'm doubling my distances like each week like how much how time far. did you have for the training like from when you signed up to five months about five months yeah you went from running maybe three miles the most you've ever run to 50 miles in five months time oh yeah and i mean it, it didn't happen overnight too but like it just got so into the training i didn't if i missed a day like i wouldn't miss a day it just was not going to happen you know i didn't <laughs> yeah. it was so important to me and it made me feel so good and yeah, it's just like the instant gratification of the running to me is just, you know, it's, it's honestly like an easy way to make yourself feel good. I know it's hard to start doing and to actually commit to it, but like I went from running one to three, the next week was five miles. And then I was like, all right, now the whole week I'm like, all right, I'm doing eight on Saturday. Oh, okay. Next Saturday we're doing 12. And then I think I started jumping bigger. I went from like 12 to 18, 18 to I think 18 to 22 and then 22 to 32. That's a and big then, jump. Then the biggest jump was 32 to 50 because the highest I trained to was 32 miles. And then two weeks before the race kind of tapered down, which 
I think ended up being a mistake, but I was following this plan. I was new to it. I had, I was, I was jumping in head first. I was like, let's just go. I'm going to listen to the body. I'm going to like really go slow so I can complete this goal. All trial and error. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only way to do it. Yeah. You could research all this, but until you actually get thrown into the situation, you don't know how you're going to react or there's about four or five different roads you can go. You just, you do it, you make a mistake, you just don't do it the next time. Yeah, I mean, when I was, there was so much stuff I looked up online that I could have been like, oh, what about this, what about that? But I guess my personality, like I said, I'm kind of extreme. I was like, you know what? Let's just be dumb about this. Like, I don't care. Like, let me just see what happens when I go five miles. Let's see if my bo- how my body reacts. And every single time, I'd be like, whoa, I just did twice as much as I ever ran in my life. And I feel like I can do that again, you know? So after you run 22 miles, how much would you run the next day? Either like two miles or nothing. Take yeah, all, take take the next the next yeah it was a it was like a seven day training program where two of the days of the week I wouldn't run at all, and one of the days was like strength training yeah. And also, what I'm amazed about is I don't actually don't know the answer to this, but were you under any manual therapy or care to keep your body in check because you're putting a lot of miles on your body and I'm sure you were feeling some aches and pains from just running every day. Yeah. Um, it was weird. I was under, I'd never really saw doctors. I saw some like GPs last year and it was a negative experience. It felt like it didn't listen to me. And then I actually saw you. I'm trying to think of when I saw you. The first time you adjusted me was during my training. During, I saw, I saw you one time though. Yeah. You saw me one time. So like <laughs> <laughs> one time in five, like that's just so impressive. Like so no acupuncture, no chiropractic, really, no massages. No, and you were feeling pretty good though. I was feeling the best I was feeling in my life. In fact, when I first came to see you, I remember you're like, "All right, so you're like, what's hurting you?" And I was like, "I like literally ran four miles in the woods right next to your office," and I was like, "I actually feel amazing right now." <laughs> like you know, like, runners like, high. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, for sure that, but just in general, like in my life at that time, like because I was on in this training and because I was doing something so new and proving to myself how like literally anything is possible. Like, and it's so many of my friends now are running. Like I have a friend who just hit eight and a half miles like two days ago and she never did more than a mile. I don't think until a couple months ago. Like that's one of the most, the more amazing things you told me a couple of weeks ago. You said not only were you feeling great and you were breaking through all these barriers in your own life, but It seemed to you, from your point of view, everybody's life around you was getting better and healthier and working through their own stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's the law of attraction too. I think, you know, I really wanted to change my life and yeah, I just wanted, it was infectious. Like I loved seeing my friends being like, oh, what? You did what? And they're like, if he could do that, I can do that. Like I love that expression on people's faces Yeah, when they're like looking at me like all messed up, you know, I got long hair and the beard, like smoking something and. I'm, I'm like i can run 50 miles you know what you know you can too and like that's the craziest thing because ever nobody expects that they can do that nobody thinks they could do that like and like if you think about it just don't stop yeah like you go walk 50 miles like everybody could walk 50 miles in a day if they really had to just yeah. don't stop and then it's just you know revving that ev- engine a little bit more and get breaking a sweat and seeing what else you could do because it does it's an, very addicting <laughs> so not only were you breaking physical barriers every day were you breaking down any emotional barriers just from like a a psychological state yeah so it's funny we've been talking about the physical part the whole time and that's like not even the reason i did it or I, yeah it's just a not really good byproduct the emotional issues and like mental issues that i've dealt with like or not dealt with in my life i feel like totally led me into doing this and and when you spend so much time running out there. Um, I did the whole 50 miles with no headphones in. No headphones. Yeah, I didn't. I just That's had a, very impressive. I just had a wash and a bottle of water. But I did that because, well, because David Goggins said so. <laughs> but also because it, I, it's just like, it's a more like focused experience and you have to like really be in the moment. But yeah, running without the headphones to me just was like a more natural experience. And, and the whole point of doing it for me was to, as Goggins says, callous the mind. And it's really just like, preparing yourself for life like you're trying to get stronger and not trying you are getting stronger every step you take further than you've been before is you like literally stronger 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 and it's the mental and emotional aspect of it is insane because you could i've had days where i'm down 
and then you go run and you're up and you're like you can deal with the down you understand that it's there's a balance in life and th- everybody's got shit to deal with and you know it really the mental strength i think is the most important and valuable thing that anybody could get out of out of physical activity definitely i missed the part where he said uh no headphones because i understand why he's talking about that because when i go for a run now i'm like all right i need to get my phone my headphones i need to get, i need to turn on the audiobook and what if there's if, if you don't have access to that you're like oh i'm not going to go run yeah or so or that's like a problem. i can't do it as long like all yeah your uh your mind starts telling you you know you know yourself the best so your mind starts telling you all of this stuff like you know what to say to yourself to get yourself yes. to stop and when you have no headphones it's easier to hear you only hear what's going on in your mind but to be fair the first two and a half months of my training i listened to the david goggins audiobook so uh, he got you. can't hurt me yeah every single time i ran you know that's really what got me started that helped me like run further you know because i'm hearing literally this guy's life story like which is so much more difficult than mine i'm like you know and he says in his book too like you know it doesn't matter if you had a hard life or maybe your life wasn't hard enough and you need to put yourself through some not that everyone needs to put themselves through suffering but this is a controlled suffering that's really good for you <laughs> there's so much growth that comes out of adversity and yeah. if you don't have any that much your entire life, like you could still be a good person and all that. But like, it's interesting to see people that have been through a lot and, and uh, gotten through it when they're young. And then you see adults that haven't really been through anything until like 40 or 50. And it's, it's, it's a huge panic. And it's, uh, it's good to face that adversity when you're young. You get ready and your mind gets callous, like you were saying before. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's going to happen, I feel like, one way or another. You know, life life has a way of balancing itself out. I've always been obsessed with the yin and the yang symbol since karate in, and yeah. in childhood. <laughs> and like it just played out so many times in life in front of me and and like yeah, like it's gonna suck. So you might as well do some stuff that sucks that you control that makes you stronger, that it is like good for you also. Like it's a direct reward. It's so quick, like it's instant and it's also long term. Like can't like recommend it enough. <laughs> That's yeah. I mean, that's, even not even just running. Like if you love swimming or, or biking, like just push yourself. Whatever it is that you like to do, like that gets your heart pumping. Like take it to the next level. Like if you if doing like fifty miles on the bike, do seventy miles on the bike because like, you can do it. Absolutely. You know? I mean, life is pretty remarkable in the sense that it's extremely fair because it's unfair for everybody. Yeah. Like at some point, it's going to hit you hard. I don't care if you've had a good life, if you've had a lot of money, if you have no money. At some point, life is going to hit you. Happens to everybody. Oh, yeah, man. And uh, yeah, I'm just very, very lucky. A shout out mom, dad, brother, Brian, sister, Sarah, my grandparents, everyone, my friends who supported me through this process. My friend, Victor, who came up for the race, drove the car. Awesome. Made the, made the protein drinks. Little supply, man, on the, yeah, you yeah, need to have one yeah. of those, right? And, uh, and my buddy, Andrew, who uh, we ran the race together, which I might as well throw in this little story about the race. So he was always a faster paced runner than me. He's a little bit leaner had that better time, you know, but before you start the story, can I stop you? I have one question for you. How did you feel come race day? Were there any doubts in your mind? Like, what am I doing? <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to make this. Or were you just, you were absolutely ready for it? Much like every other run is like, I don't want to go run, <laughs> but I was pumped for sure to start the race. It was exciting. You know, the race started, there's like announcers, there's music playing, there's other all these other people doing the same thing that you're doing. It's like, whoa, this is crazy that all of these other people are doing this too. You know, all of a sudden, how many people were at the race? Maybe seventy people. It was a twenty-five mile group, a fifty mile group, and a hundred mile group. It's called the Beast of Burden in Lockport, New York. Everybody should check it out and sign up. There's a winter one coming up too. Really test to see yeah. what you got during the winter. How did you feel? Like, right, was there any doubts, or you're like, I got this. I mean, it's a roller coaster. Every long run is a roller coaster. So in the beginning, the first 15 miles were like a breeze. It was a beautiful day. And then I had left one aid station with like an electrolyte drink. I should have taken a water and I actually got a little dehydrated and I like, you know, whatever. There's this one little section and I got through that five miles, got some water and I was cool. But the doubt, you know, when I was hitting about, I, I'll get back to this story now because this will all tie together. So Andrew is a faster paced runner than me. And he started out kind of hot. He thought he could like win the whole race, which he, physically I think he could have if he did some more leg training. You know, he's got, we've got work to do, but he totally is capable of running at the time to win. But he went out of the gate hot the first, I think after like 12 or something miles, I think he hurt his knee. 
and started he had to start walking immediately so from mile 12 to like 25 or 27 he was walking basically in the pain cage as wow. we learned to call it the pain cage i uh, on the other hand was more of a slow burn and probably to mile 27 28 is when we, he caught up to me because i had to walk because my left knee left achilles right hip was starting to burn and then we started kind of waddling jogging walking waddling jogging all the way home from like about 30 miles to the last 20 miles the last 20 miles was like a little gimpy yeah it was just insane and but right before i kind of like succumbed to realizing that i had to stop my pace or slow my pace down if i really wanted to finish it my brain was like all right dude you like i think i passed 32 miles which is the furthest i'd ever ran at that point I was like, my brain was like, all right, you did it further than you've ever done. You can stop now and nobody would be like, you're not good enough because you, you literally just beat your best. And if you did that and then you, if you quit now, then you'd be good. And like, it's crazy, dude. Like I was there, I'm at the freaking race and my brain's still like, dude, come on, you're good. Don't just stop it. It's so easy. The, the angel and the devil on the shoulder is so real. And then, you know, my angel now is, I feel like it used to be like a little angel. Now it's like a buff, buff ass angel who like, who like knocks that that voice out and is like no dude you're doing it like there's no there's no quitting like it's like drink another gel eat some pb and j do whatever you got to do smoke a little herb and uh it was one of the most interesting and exciting experiences of my life and it was cool i got to do it with one of my best friends and yeah we were we were like together the last like 20 miles almost limping talking and you guys talk. and you guys finished together yeah what do you have to do to prepare for a race like that nutritionally and are, do you have anything on you, like Camelback? No, a lot. I saw a lot of Camelbacks at the race. I just held a bottle. I had kind of like a ergonomic bottle that was easy to carry that I would just kind of switch hands the whole time. Like for whatever reason, I think, I don't know. I was just like David Goggins is a good role model. So I saw, I think I saw him do it. And it's like, you know what, that's, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. And I had just like running shorts and gels in my... Gels. Like uh, running, like running gel or uh, energy gels, I guess. Um, I'll shout out Hammer Nutrition. They sponsored the race, and that's how I heard about them. And they, uh, I ordered ordered their energy gels, and it's basically like potassium and magnesium and malodextrin. I don't even know really what's in it, but it's good for energy, and it, and it replaces your glucose and sugar. And so, how many did you down throughout the race? Probably like one or two an hour i crushed the gels but like my friend andrew like didn't really like the gels as much i don't think he had as much they also have these enduro light pills which i think that's actually like magnesium and potassium mostly and those just pre help prevent cramping so the calories with of the gels and then like every five miles i'd have like a protein this like this formula they have called perpetuum i'm just doing a whole big so like you just shout out to the whole, catalog right now you went through like, the whole catalog yeah i mean all of it was like really good and then on top of that i had like pb and j on white bread um like while jogging we'd, we'd take bricks there was an aid station every seven miles i think seven and a half miles and every like five miles like there was a like my friend victor could stop with the car uh the crew as they refer to it in the ultra world i'm still a newbie but so you know he he had like you know just like electrolyte like fizz drinks and stuff like that just on the ready anything like i was like yo hit me with some huckleberry gel what a guy. That's a 15-hour uh, journey with you. He's the homie, man. He took care of us. But yeah, so during the race, it was actually at mile 38, they had pizza for us. I had like four pieces of cold pizza, and it was the best pizza I'd ever eaten in my life. Is it weird running like that, stopping, and then putting an entire pizza? No. And, yeah, and then running no, again? No, because it's you're- It's not weird running with like a full stomach like that? At least at that point, after 38 miles, it wasn't for me. I felt like my body was just- so starved for calories. I think the, the rule of thumb is you got to like replace one third. So I burned about 6,500 calories. So I think I needed to have about like 2,000 calories or something to like not to not destroy all of my muscles, you know. Wow. And I really wasn't that good about it. I wasn't thinking about it that much. I, I just tried to listen to my body and not. I tried to not overstuff myself with anything. Like I said, there was a about 15 miles in. There was a five mile stretch where. I brought an electrolyte drink out with me and I should have just brought water because the sun just started getting real hot and wasn't as hydrated as I thought I was, which is, you know, rookie mistake. But other than that, I think I did a really good job of just listening to my body and being like, okay, it's been an hour. Take a gel. You're going to see the aid station in an hour and a half. You're going to get a protein, a 200 calorie protein drink 
and maybe like they had they had bowls of M and M's and potato chips. Like ultra runners, it's really they say it's like an eating contest. Like you can eat whatever the hell you want because you're burning so many calories. Like um, leading up to the race, though, I definitely shout out to your cousin Ellie Moynihan out there on the West Coast. What's in Ellie's belly? On also Instagram. another podcast guest. Shout out Ellie Moynihan. Yeah, she is amazing. She hooked me up with so many recipes, like healthy, like meal prep recipes that for the last like three months, I think of my training helps me like eat regularly. And like, it's really like the training is the biggest thing because race day is like all everything's, it doesn't matter. You just like, how am I feeling? And what do I want? You like, you look at your standard, all this food and you're like, I'm putting that in my body right now. We're going like, and like ultra runners are crazy. Like I saw a guy take a shit like on the side of the, like he was, I was pacing with him for probably like an hour. And then he's just like, stopped pulled his pants down in like two seconds, like before I even caught up and passed him. And I was like passing him like, <laughs> this guy is, you know, does, is just nonchalant. And like, I saw another dude puking, like there's a hardcore vibe there, but it's also like not to me at the same time. It's like, that's what you do to achieve your goals. Like it's like how you better yourself. Like if you, if you stop just cause you vomited, like put more food down. Like, I mean, sometimes you're really sick. You have to stop. If you're, you know, <laughs> that's the other thing too. But um, luckily I haven't, I haven't found that limit yet. And I'm, I'm, was there any delirium setting in like Goggins in his book? He was like talking about like he saw some guys like running in circles because they were that so out of it. And like, did any delirium set in for like hallucinating? No, not for me. Like I mentioned before, I like kind of was smoking some weed, like not, not that much, but like, like one hit every like couple hours. And, and so I was already like just buzzing myself the whole time. And I felt great the whole time. I've read that the delirium sets in more when you're getting into the 100 mile range. Yeah, around 70, 80 miles. I've heard of people doing that. Um, there's this incredible woman, uh, Cor- Courtney Dullwater. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, she uh, won this race called the Moab 240, which is like a 240 plus mile race. And I think she only slept for like 10 minutes or a minute or some ridiculous amount and beat everybody by a ton. I'm not even going to say how much because I don't know the exact number, but she crushed everybody by like hours and hours and hours. And she talks about, she's like drinking beer and eating mac and cheese and like, and she's just like tiny, like little, like not, she's an amazing woman, you know, she's like, just you look at her and she just looks like a regular girl. She just looks like a regular girl. Yeah. And she won the entire race. Yeah. And she is like one of like, I think one of the best ultra runners, I think who's, who's doing it right now. Do you think there's a common denominator with some of the best ultra runners that you've noticed or? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like the, uh, the guy who won the race that I ran in, I forget what he said. It was the relentless pursuit of forward motion. I feel like it was more poetic than that, but <laughs> you know, it's just like really, there's never an end to showing what you're capable of because your life, you know, you're only here for so long and you're not going to reach you're not going to retire up at, I mean, one day your body's going to give out and you can't run 50 miles anymore but there was a 75 year old man who did 50 miles in our group yeah 70 years old. yeah so i think the thing that like remains true amongst all anybody who's in ultra running not even the best ones i think anyone who decides to do it is that it's just a relentless pursuit of like bettering yourself and like this is one experience that just makes you feel so alive and so in the moment like people are always talking about being in the moment and you know meditating and just trying to find They'll do, people do anything to like forget the past and the future for a moment, you know? And the last, I, it's, I said it 14 hours it took for the 50 miles, the last like four hours, five hours was the most in the moment, like moments of my life. The last 10 minutes of the race coming up on the finish line, like knowing that I got, I did it, knowing that no, like I'm going to crawl at this point. Like yeah. anything happens. I actually stepped in a pothole. Then no like, way, and, and last I'm 10 like, minutes? And, like, and I was like already oh. gimpy and tweaking and I, it was in the dark and I didn't have my headlamp like pointed down quite and I stepped in the pot. Well, but anyway, it was just the most in the moment I had ever felt and, and like my friend Andrew was like, can you believe it's been like 14 hours? And I looked at him and I was like, it doesn't feel like, I feel like we're just like, I, I can't even comprehend what that means right now. You know, like I was, it was so just like, there's the finish line and we're still going and after this, we're going to sit <laughs> and drink a beer. <laughs> And that's like, honestly, the, the prettiest moments in life, the most beautiful moments are when you're just happy to be doing what you're doing, <laughs> like right like right now. <laughs> and what was that exact feeling crossing the line? It's done. It's over. You just ran 50 miles in one shot in the time limit you wanted to. Now I have to do 100 miles. 
<laughs> that, that was that that was on my mind yeah so before i ran the, the day of like it was in lockport near niagara falls we went to the falls had like a beautiful weekend and the whole time and the training too i'm like i'm just gonna run this 50 miles like i'm not a runner like this is just some crazy thing i'm gonna do and then the weekend i'm like all right this is coming up i was kind of getting nervous i was like and then when we started running the race i was like all right this is the only 50 mile race i still was telling myself like i was actively thinking about this and then somewhere i think around like probably mile 40 45 maybe i was like i think i really like this <laughs> i think i really like I think I underprepared so much. I could have done so much more to run the race better, but damn, I did it. <laughs> yeah, at that point I hadn't done it, and then when I did do it, right when I crossed the finish line, I was like, "There's definitely more for me to do." I was so in so much pain and hurt to walk. The next day was brutal, but as I crossed the finish line, I still had energy, man. I still like probably like a real clear energy. Yeah, too. it's it's uh, it's like I almost like knew it. That was going to happen too because that's what happens after you run further than you've ever run before you realize oh like you know i still have energy to walk home yep. and open the fridge and make myself food and turn the tv on and you know brush my teeth and like you know you realize it's like oh like what else am i capable of how much have i been lying to myself about what i'm capable of doing you know what what am i saying is okay that i'm really not okay with and then it leads you to, to crazy shit like run <laughs> 50 miles now how did that affect other areas of your life because you just did this extreme amazing accomplishment that clearly dealt with running and did it transcend to any other areas of your life after that i think to every other aspect of my life it's like permeated like unbelievably it's like it's the mental work you do through it like the strength that you build it just gives you gave me so much confidence like in everything else and and Goggins has the accountability mirror and you write post it's like what is what are you all about like what are you doing today to like better yourself to achieve your goals like how does that work the post it's you basically like I mean, through the book there's like 10 challenges and he basically just forces i mean he doesn't force you but you you just have to like ask yourself like what are you happy about about your life what are you sad like what are you not okay with like so you, you write know, down your, it all yeah. happy not okay yeah, yeah. Like, what are what are what are your goals? How are you going to achieve those goals? Like, long term or short term? Like, and that's powerful. Yeah, I listened to the book and I like I was like, oh, it's a challenge. I didn't do it. Yeah, I mean, I listened to the book about five times, and the first four times I didn't do it. In fact, I didn't do it till after I ran the fifty miles because <laughs> it was a lot to deal with. It was a lot of emotional issues I didn't want to deal with and t think about. It was a lot of like personal issues I didn't want to deal with. I didn't want to admit to myself, which is. Running is actually a good escape for that also because you work and you make your body starts looking better. So you're not necessarily dealing with the actual issue. Yeah. which is Until you decide to actually deal with yeah, it. Yeah, which and see, exactly. Then you make a conscious decision to be like, okay, I'm going to go run and talk to myself about how I'm dealing with this situation or this relationship. And That's probably not easy either. <laughs> no, it's not. And it's something like I still struggle with like to this day. It's not like... It's interesting that you're going for a run exercising and thinking out yeah you gotta get you gotta get two birds stoned at the same time <laughs> 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 all right that's that's how they say it but yeah i mean good mentor of mine who uh, i feel like I'm, I'm a lot of like i always used to say like people would call me lazy but i'm not lazy i'm efficient <laughs> you know like like i don't want to go to a psychiatrist and i don't want to like go to a trainer so let me go kick my own ass on the track and see what i'm made of and See, see what my brain's made of too, you know, like, and yeah, that's my, that's my psychiatrist's office, you know, and, and some good friends too. You gotta, you gotta have some good friends to talk to. Absolutely. Just let it go. Yeah. <laughs> so the accountability mirror really, uh, helped you sift, sift through some stuff there. Yeah. I mean, it's something I, I've actually only recently started doing. The race was just over a month ago and I listened to the Goggins book again, post race doing a, an autopsy, if you will, I think as he calls it. And, you know, that's one of the blaring things that I was lying to myself about, even through this whole process. Like, I just ignored his call to action. And like I said, I just, I wanted to just do one thing at a time. I felt it was pretty overwhelming to do it all. And it's probably a lot like the running where you post one post and you're like, oh, that felt pretty good. And then you just keep putting them up until it actually Yeah, I mean, permeates. it's so much easier too, because like, it's less stressful when you write stuff down and like have it out there. And like, you don't need to remember to do the things that you know you want to do. Which I know sounds like crazy, but like just having to look at it instead of like literally like it's the difference between carrying it around with you all day 
and not doing it because there's some days where like I'm not doing certain goals because other things have to get done. And I look at it every day, but when I leave the house, that's it. Like I'm not thinking about it all day because I know it's there back on the mirror and I know tomorrow I'm going to tackle it or tonight I'm going to tackle it, you know? And before I, it was just like, everything was kind of jumbled in my brain. Like, oh, I got to do this. I got to do that. I don't know when I'm going to do this. I don't know when I'm going to do that. Now it's like, all right, I, I'm like using my 24 hours a lot more efficiently, which no, another great guy who's, who's really on that game, Jesse Itzler, who had Goggins come live with him and wrote a book called Living with the Seal. And he, he's like part owner in the Hawks, sold Zico Water. Zico was his company, Zico Coconut Water. Marquis Jet was his company. He's like beast, Long Island guy. And uh, I think I, I walked at his Instagram post just before and he, he like doles out his day. It's like 6.30 to like 11 p.m. And it's like family time, running. It's uh, all like planned speech, out. Speech, speech time. Yeah. And he's like posting it to everyone. And it's like every minute of the day is like filled with like even his, he's like an hour and a 15 minute for a flight. That's the only thing that was on there that wasn't him. Like, and he's traveling to do, go do speeches, you know, and he's running in like two different states in the same day. Like, this is savage, you know, there's no excuse not to like do things that you want to do. You know, if people, I mean, some people just don't want to exercise and they don't want to run. That's, that's fine. But some people say they want to, but they can't because you don't have time, my job, my this, my that, my knees yeah. aren't good. It's like, if you, if you aren't that active and your knees are hurting, like it's because you're not active, you need yeah. to stretch, you know, you take it slow. Listen to your body, but you know you need to start moving around, get the blood flowing. Absolutely, and it could pertain to any aspect of your life. I think, like Goggins was saying in his book, he said uh, it doesn't have to be running or working out or anything. He's like, go read more books than you've ever read before. Like it could be like a mental workout, breaking a mental sweat. That's uh, it's so like like you kind of said before, like if you have no intention of running or exercising, it's more for the people that say they want to do it. And they're still sitting on the couch yeah, and kind of mad at themselves that they didn't do it. Yeah. It's just like, honestly, holding yourself accountable. Like, I mean, li life is crazy. It's easy to like, just kind of fall into a rut. But like, at least for me, like I always told myself, I was like, or people always told me too, I was capable of doing like great things. And I felt that. And then one day I was like, I can definitely do more than I'm doing now. And yeah, this just turned it right around. And one of the other amazing things I took from that book was, Goggins is he's nuts dude but like he's very efficient and he makes sense he makes sense and when it came to like everybody like a lot of people say they visualize and don't think about like the badges only envision yourself having it and it's there and everything's good Goggins was the first person I ever heard which I thought was on May he's like visualize anything that can go wrong yeah and he's right because no matter how much you visualize that perfect thing happening there's always speed bumps things are gonna go wrong there's yeah <laughs> and he's like visualize those things that go wrong so when they do you are ready for it and if it doesn't happen what's the big deal you're ready for it anyway i thought that was like brilliant yeah i mean like callousing your mind preparing for those moments in life you know are gonna suck you know we're all gonna lose loved ones we all have lost loved ones like that's a reality that like <laughs> nobody likes dealing with i don't think you know and just preparing yourself to be strong in these moments because you're going to need to be strong for other family members for yourself too you know to get through and you know make every day worth it enjoy like this gift that we have you know and, and also like you were saying before about applying this to other like facets of your life like one of uh, goggins like hardest things for him was like learning in school like he used to always like cheat and when he got to taking military tests he could no longer cheat because everyone next to him had different tests and he had to actually start studying and he had a real problem with that. And, and like, yeah, he was he, dyslexic. Yeah. Third grade reading level at like a senior in high school. Yeah. I mean, he, he literally like could not read when it was like a grown man. And then he realized, I think it was just like memory. He had to read it like things over and over and over and over again. And he like, just like he applied like his crazy mindset to running, he did it with studying too. And eventually I think the test was called the ASVAB, like the Navy Quali qualifying test or something a written test yeah. yeah and i forget how many times he took it but multiple multiple times and he failed and failed and failed and the, you can hear the joy in his book in his voice when he tells when even the other guy talks about telling when he finally passed the test it's actually an annotation at the end of the chapter because they would talk have a conversation about each chapter which is why the audiobook is really valuable and like you could hear in his voice in the audiobook like i felt like i was there within the room with him like oh like i was ha so happy for him too you know 
And not to mention, most of his accomplishments didn't start to at least his late twenties. Yeah, man. Maybe even thirty. He was killing cockroaches at steak and shakes, like at midnight. So, like, this wasn't a dude that was just completely driven, perfect his entire life. And it's not like he was born with these skills to endure everything he's gone through. Like, he was not doing much in his late twenties. Right. That's and look where he's at now. Right. In, in a way, his, his upbringing was, was very abusive and messed up, but in a way that actually, you know, it's kind of like the balance of life, like the early parts of his life were so traumatic and so stressful that I feel like it probably did prepare his brain. Like, unfortunately, like it prepared his brain to like run 200 miles, hold the world record for, for pull-ups. Like there's videos of this nut. You got to check him out. He's a beast. I mean, probably... Any person that's like that in any field, guarantee there was there it wasn't a smooth coast. Yeah. Oh yeah. So like where they're at, because like you don't get like that from just like winning all the time. Right. Right. <laughs> or having an easy life for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, there's a good quote for every action. There's an equal and opposite reaction. I think I nailed that. Whoa. Murphy's laws, I think. Yeah. I mean, that's that's real. Absolutely. Yin Yang, baby. So, Ev, what are you up to now? What's next on the list? You going straight for 100 uh, miles here? What's going on? I'm heading out to Seattle to visit my buddy John. Called the, there's a trail there called the Enchantments Through Hike. It's 20 miles. I think a couple, maybe 8,000 feet in elevation, 10,000, not sure. But the altitude and oxygen is going to be a big adjustment for me, a big challenge. And the hike, too. I think there's like 2,000 feet in elevation gang over three quarters of a mile, which is almost like straight up. I looked at some photos online, so I'm going to be doing a lot of squats getting ready for that. Uh, 20 miles. Okay, and it's uphill. A lot up, of... Up a mountain. Yeah, yeah, up, up and then I think it comes back down almost almost the same too. So that's in about a month from now. Very excited for that. And then, yeah, I, next year, I haven't picked a race yet, but definitely going to sign for an ultra. I might do another 50, try to improve on that time. The hundreds... I don't know if my body's ready for it after that one because I, uh, I, I gotta, I gotta come see you a bit more. Get the, I don't get know if stretching. anybody's body's ever ready for a hundred mile run. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> Most like every time you heard uh, Goggins or somebody else running it, it was like they were far from being in perfect health just from training. Yeah, probably. In fact, there's a great moment in his book where he's running a Vegas marathon with his wife and mother. And he was just going to walk it because it was, it was after, I think, his first 100 miles that he did, which I think he did in no training. You, yeah. When he ran it like he decided like that week. Yeah. He decided to run 100 miles that week and he did so, it. So like a couple months later, he still like has trouble walking. <laughs> uh, Dude, it, it honestly might have been weeks. And maybe it was weeks. It might have yeah. been like sooner. All right. We gotta, I don't you, know. Yeah, we got to get confirmation out. on that. But it, it was because he was still pretty banged up. Right. He had he, no he was, business being on a track. Right. He said he was going to walk the marathon and then he started the race and then like shortly into it just started cruising. I think he ran like a three hour, like three and a half hour pace. Mate qualified for the Boston Marathon. Yeah. Anything is possible, people. Absolutely. So, Ev, at the end of every show, I like to ask people what is one piece of advice that has really resonated with you over the years? that you would like to gift the audience could be absolutely anything. Just love yourself. I feel like that's where everything starts. I mean, if your cup is not full, it's hard to give to others. It's hard to be compassionate. And, you know, that's where kind of wisdom wise, I feel like is caring for others and feeling full yourself and just, just love yourself. <laughs> Pour from an empty cup. Yeah, that's right. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. Very, very impressive athletic feat that you accomplished. Unbelievable. And uh, I'd like to have you back on uh, when you do the 100. Thanks so much for having me, man. We'll love to come back. We'll see you soon for sure. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for listening. If you enjoy the podcast, subscribe, give us five stars, and leave a review. It really helps boost the podcast and spread the good word. My chiropractic practice is located in West Orange, New Jersey at Montclair Upper Cervical Chiropractic. You can also find us on Facebook at Montclair Upper Cervical Chiropractic. All of my information is on my website at drkevinpecka.com, drkevinpecka.com. You can subscribe to my YouTube channel at drkevinpecka.com. 
for podcast episodes, patient testimonials, and educational videos. I have daily affirmations and inspirational quotes on Instagram at Easel Affirmations, E-A-S-E-L Affirmations. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me at drkevinpecka at gmail.com, drkevinpecka at gmail.com. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Cheers.